and the thousands who showed up for a shot at a job in an auto plant hoping to win the job lottery. Because things are so bad, because the stakes are so high, the talks that have been going on in Washington to raise the nation's debt ceiling and then some could not be more important right now. And with a major deadline approaching August 2nd, it's time to consider at least what happens if they don't have a deal. It's where we begin tonight. We'll start off our coverage with NBC's Kristen Welker at the White House. Kristen, good evening. Brian, good evening. A source close to the talks tells me that tonight's discussion was not tense, that President Obama continued to push for a very big deal. Well, that did not happen. And now here's the headline. There are no talks scheduled for tomorrow. The president and congressional leaders convene for a fifth time in as many days, but still no deal to raise the debt limit. The Treasury Secretary has warned the nation will default on its loans if an agreement isn't reached by August 2nd. We looked at all available options, and we have no way to give Congress more time to solve this problem. The president continuing to call for action. What's required here in Washington is that uh, politicians understand now is not the time to play games. Now is not the time to posture. Now is the time to do what's right by the country. This after tense talks on Wednesday. At one point, the president reportedly said enough is enough to House Majority Leader Eric Cantor for his refusal to give in on tax hikes. Cantor says Mr. Obama stormed out of the meeting, which Democratic sources deny. And you know, there's really only one person who has not made any concessions, and that is uh, Ma Majority Leader Cantor. Today, Cantor stood his ground. We're not going to raise the debt ceiling uh, if we don't have cuts in excess of that amount, that we don't want to raise taxes. Republicans seeming to close ranks today amidst reports that Cantor has undercut Speaker John Boehner. Let me just say, uh, <laughs> we have been in this fight together. Uh, and any suggestion that uh, the, the role that Eric has played in this meeting uh, has been anything less than helpful is just wrong. The urgency to get a deal done heightened by two major credit agencies warning they would downgrade the nation's top-notch credit rating if a deal isn't reached soon. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid says it's a wake-up call. We have just a few hours, maybe a few days, to work this out. Now, there had been some chatter about moving the talks to Camp David to create a relaxed and private environment to try to break this deadlock. That never gained any traction, and my source tells me that the next time they will hold these talks will possibly, possibly be during the weekend. Brian. All right, Kristen Welker starting us off at the White House. Kristen, thanks. And now again, this deadline is August 2nd. It's been called the unthinkable. Most people think they will somehow hammer out a deal preventing the government from defaulting on its obligations. But it doesn't hurt to ask at this point, what if they don't? NBC's Tom Costello is with us from our D.C. newsroom tonight. Tom, good evening. Hi, Brian. Most financial analysts and economists are in agreement on this issue, that if the U.S. were to default on its debt, the fragile economic recovery now underway could be seriously threatened. If the country needed another warning about the risks of not raising the debt ceiling, the nation's top banker today used very simple and direct language. I think it would be a calamitous outcome. It would create a very severe financial shock that would have uh, effects not only in the U.S. economy, but on the global economy. Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke warns the shock would immediately cascade from the banking sector and into the nation's heartland. Here's how. Most analysts agree interest rates on U.S. Treasury bonds would quickly rise, and that would push all interest rates higher, including new mortgages, credit cards, car, and small business loans, eventually affecting prices for everything we buy. Meanwhile, the Bipartisan Policy Center estimates the government would immediately have to slash spending by 44 percent. President Obama would ultimately have to choose between cutting military salaries, unemployment benefits, student loans, defense contracts, federal law enforcement, courts, civil service jobs, Medicare, and interest rate payments to U.S. bondholders. 
Despite the Social Security Trust Fund, analysts say those checks would still be at risk. The former director of the Congressional Budget Office. All the money comes into the Treasury and all the money goes out. And when you're working in real time, dollars are dollars. And so Social Security looks like everything else. While skeptics disagree over whether August 2nd is a true deadline before the country defaults, most experts don't want to chance it. CNBC's Steve Leisman. If they don't act, they could seriously undermine confidence in U.S. Treasuries, in the U.S. dollar, and in the United States in general. And that could put the financial markets into a tailspin. Should it happen, scholars say it would be the first true national default in the nation's history. Now, there's an argument that the 14th Amendment makes defaulting unconstitutional, and as a last resort, that could give the president the authority to raise the debt ceiling on his own. But that's clearly not what the White House wants to resort to, Brian. All right, Tom, we're still in for days of this, and we'll follow it closely. Tom Costello in our Washington newsroom. Thank at the top of the broadcast, this scene that you're about to see happen in Dallas, Texas, and what a sign of the economic times there today. A huge crowd lined up beginning last night for a chance to just fill out an application for federal housing assistance. When the line moved toward the building in the early hours of the morning after waiting all night, a stampede broke out. Several people were injured in the crowd, including a pregnant woman. This morning marked the first time in two years the Dallas Housing Authority has accepted applications for Section 8 housing vouchers. Also in the news tonight, our environment. Now to what some are calling the great drought of 2011. The state of Texas, for one, one of the 14 states suffering and sweltering through this disaster. Some have been comparing to the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. An epic drought. The experts started tracking back in February. It hasn't stopped spreading. Now covers just about the entire lower third of this country. Water supplies are drying up. Crops, cattle are dying, and there's, there's no relief relief in sight, sadly. NBC's Tan Trung is in Waller, Texas, just north of Houston tonight. Tan, good evening. Brian, good evening to you. This drought is choking the life out of cattle and crops. Just take a look at this parched cornfield. One of the hardest hit areas is right here in Texas, where the first six months of this year have been the driest in more than a century. The drought that's baking a massive swath of the southern U.S. is the most extreme since scientists started tracking drought conditions more than a decade ago. Almost 12% of the country is now enduring a brutal combination of high temperatures and too little rain. In Texas, 213 of 254 counties have been declared disaster areas. Some ranchers struggling to feed their cattle are forced to either sell or slaughter them. Normally, fertile farmlands are bone dry. The Texas Farm Bureau says the state's wheat crop is a loss. And hardest hit here is cotton, which accounts for half of the U.S. crop. Estimated agricultural losses in Texas alone total more than $3 billion. I can remember it being dry. I can remember it being wet. But never this dry, never this hot. In Oklahoma, there's no relief in sight. We're talking about this long-term severe drought, it's going to take some major tropical moisture to actually get us close to average for much of the state. And it does not look like that's in the cards here over the next week or so, and that is some bad news. In central Georgia, farmers hoping for yellow corn are seeing only rows of withering brown stalks. The drought has affected this area um, very severely. Um, the corn crop's going to be way off this year. Further south in Florida, this should be the rainy season. But at Lake Okeechobee, water levels are dangerously low, potentially disastrous for the more than 6 million people who depend on this reservoir for their drinking water and recreation. Uh, no business for everybody around the lake. Uh, probably no water for Palm Beach County to drink. The drought has fueled an outbreak of wildfires from Arizona to Florida, burning 5 million acres so far, searing images of a scorching summer. Well, there is a small amount of rain forecasted for this region. One climatologist called this a dead landscape, Ryan. That's going to take a lot of years to fully recover. All right, Ton Trung outside of Houston, Texas tonight. Ton, thanks. And you know how it's always feast or famine elsewhere. We've had some wild weather across the country this week. It got really wild in Denver last night. A hailstorm damaged 40 different aircraft as three-quarter-inch wide hail fell for about 15 minutes. The winds there reached 75 
five knots. The storm set a new single day record for rainfall at the airport. And because of all the flight cancellations, a thousand people had to spend the night inside the airport terminal there at DIA. There was a dramatic twist to... Now, listen, just like everybody touts the success of capitalistic entrepreneurial adventures and journeys of global economy, please believe there is global depression. And please believe that everything that is being affected in this country and around the world, which is to be consistent with, with devastation and famines, will affect us here in St. Louis. And then we in here in St. Louis, we cut our own throat because we're not being proactive. You know, you need to mitigate problems. You need to foresee problems. Everybody's talking about the unforeseen here in St. Louis when the 80-year-old woman died as though she slipped through the cracks. That somehow nobody, uh, it was just one of those things. Uh-uh. No. We need to be proactive. And you see what happened in Dallas when the housing uh, 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 Section 8 was open, trampled, stampede. That's the bottom. That's the subflow. Listen, we are folding in and imploding St. Louis and the United States and the world. We need to be proactive in assisting and helping each other and quit being selfish with all of these special interests. We need to look at the principle of man helping man simply. Republican, Democrats, black, whites, everybody together. It's the wheelchair profit. We out from the best side. It's the wheelchair profit. This how my mama and them got it. This how I got it. And I want to tell you, with everything going down nowadays, Jesus can still work it out. Come on, Westside Churchin with George G. Hayes and the Cosmopolitan Choir from the South Side of Chicago. What's up, GD? South Side. What's up, Latin King? We don't need no walk of faith. And we don't need none of that old country hillbilly garbage. Uh, that crippled old dollar taking. Uh, come on. Uh, tell somebody. Uh, Jesus. Uh, come on, say Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Uh, uh, Jesus can work it out. Y'all might as well get ready, cause we have it set around here! Ah, Lord! Tell somebody. Reach over and tear your boy. That's leaning, wake him up and say, Jesus, he can work it out. Come on. How many of y'all know when your back was up against the wall and it seemed like you couldn't make it? Didn't the Lord?
step in right on time. Come on and say yeah. 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 Ah, yeah.